Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about changes in human connectedness and what kinds of implications that's having. And I'm, I'm going to focus on three trends. And one is just basic globalization and densification. So the networks that we have are, are getting denser. Hopefully slides will be popping up soon. Yeah, push your button. Yeah. Let's see, there we go, okay. Um, so then uh, the second trend is that, that the connectedness that we have and the internet are allowing us to become more segmented than we were before. And so that the societies are actually breaking into uh, more cliquish groups than before. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some evidence for that and, and also what its implications are and for polarization and, and other things. And then I want to end with just some, some comments on how the internet is changing news production and in particular how the fact that news can be spread so quickly and repackaged so quickly is changing the incentives for people to do deep investigative reporting and some worries about that uh, for democracy. So the, the first thing I'll start with is just you know, basic trends and, and, and basically really good news. Um, so the, let's see if this is the right, it just does move quickly. Okay, so the, the first one is, is one that Anne's going to talk about in more detail, and this is just looking at the world trade figures over uh, a little more than the last century, and there's been an enormous growth since the Second World War and since the 1950s, where we've gone from roughly 20% to more than 60% in terms of, of GDP, uh, imports and imports imports and exports over GDP. So there's been a, a huge growth in international trade, and that's been accompanied by a dramatic decrease in the number of wars in the world. So this is a plot of the number of wars per country, per pair of countries, um, from the, the Napoleonic period, going back to just after the Napoleonic Wars up through the present. And what I've, I've sort of circled in that red dot at the, at the end is what's been happening since the 1950s. And if you look at the data carefully, this is from a study I did with Stephen Nye, the, the number of wars has dropped by more, more or less a factor of 10 um, from if you go before 1950 to post-1950. And it, you can measure wars in different ways. You can get it from a factor of 5 to a factor of 10, depending on what kind of conflicts you're using and whether you're measuring it by deaths or, or uh, mobilization, etc. But the, the number has dropped dramatically. And the numbers correspond very closely with trade. So if you look at the correlation, when, once two countries trade more than a certain percentage of their GDP, they basically just do not go to war with each other anymore. And uh, the, the data are, are, are quite striking in terms of the strong correlation between trade patterns and the absence of war. And when you look at most of the wars that still exist in the world, the Great Congo Wars in Africa were probably the most deadly in the last couple of decades, um, ongoing conflicts in a lot of, of, of the world are ones where there's, there, there's basically absent trading relationships, and, and that you know, it is, is something that is quite disturbing when you start looking at things like Brexit and uh, current uh, trade negotiations that are going on. But the, the good news is sort of you know, these things are, are dramatically improving. It's also made a huge difference in uh, the poverty rate around the world. So this is just looking at the, the percentage of the world that lives below the poverty line. In 1980, that was more than 40%. Now it's less than 10%. So the, you know, the, the, the world has improved in a lot of ways, and that part of that is due to, to trade and foreign investment. So if you look at foreign direct investment in a lot of countries, especially India and China, um, roughly in, in uh, 2000, there was about $26 trillion flowing between countries. Now it's about 100, over $130 trillion. Um, out of about 300 trillion uh, that flows between countries. So the, the, the investment that's going across country borders is, is enormous, and that, that's really integrated the world on a new level. Um, associated, uh, uh, along with these sort of technological changes in, in trade that have changed things, there's also been the internet, which has grown up, and now it's remarkable to think about how rapidly this has happened. This has happened in, in more or less uh, the last 10 to 15 years. But this is just looking at the, per, the number of monthly active users in different internet platforms. So Facebook is over 2 billion, WeChat's over a billion. You can look here, you know, YouTube, um, WhatsApp, uh, Q, QQ, QZone. There's a whole series in China. 
Uh, but the, the sheer number of people that are connecting in these ways is enormous. And um, what I want to say uh, in, in sort of the second trend is this is changing the way people connect. And, and one part of the good news about this is that people are connected around the world much more than they were able to before. And that is that helping a lot of people in, in having access to information, access to, to courses online, all sorts of things that, that weren't available before. Um, but at the same time, it's also changing the structure of these networks. And so if I can get this, whoops. There we go. Um, so there's, there's a, a tendency for people, which is to connect with other people who are very similar to themselves. And that's known as homophily. And what I've done is put up a picture here, which is just illustrative of this kind of phenomenon. What this is is a social network. And this is from a study I did with Sergio Curarini and Paulo Pin. This is a network of high school students. And this is a US high school. These are color coded by race. So each dot is a student. And there's a connection between two students if they're friends together. And I didn't place the dots on the picture. What the, the way that they're separated was by an algorithm. And the algorithm tries to push people together if they're friends and pull them apart if they're not friends. The blue dots are black students. The yellow dots are white students. And the red dots are Hispanic students. And you can begin to see that even though this is a high school that was very integrated on paper, it's completely segregated when you get inside the friendship patterns, right? So, so here, students are 15 times more likely to be friends with somebody of their own race than to be friends across races. So this kind of tendency, you know, here you see it racially in a US high school, but it exists on all sorts of dimensions. It exists by religion, profession, age, gender. You sort of name it any way you cut human networks, people tend to, to seek out other people who are similar to themselves and associate with people who are similar to themselves. Um, one thing that's happening because of the internet is that that's tending to increase. And it increases for two reasons. One is that you can connect to more people so you can look around the world and find people who are similar to yourselves. And the other is that algorithms are built to suggest things to you. And it suggests things in two ways. One is it looks for what you like and it tries to feed you things you like. And the other is that it connects people to you through your existing friends. So if you're already friends with somebody, it'll suggest those people's friends as new friends. And so as your network grows, it tends to grow with people who are, are similar to you. So this sort of reinforces itself and produces um, networks that are very introspective and, and more segregated than, than they ever have been. Now, in terms of measuring this, it's somewhat difficult, but uh, you know, one one set of studies are a set of studies that look at when internet came into certain areas and then looks at po political polarization depending on that rollout and tries to look at random, random elements of, of internet changes in different areas. Um, so for instance, Anya uh, Prumer has looked at internet availability in the US and she, her, her estimates were that once internet came into a given area, there was a 22% increase in the political polarization in terms of the, the uh, change in attitudes politically um, after the internet came into those areas. So there's some evidence that that actually uh, helps exacerbate this kind of structure. Um, my own colleague, Matt Jenskow, has done work with Jesse Shapiro and Matt Taddy, sort of looking at, at political polarization and speech and, and found that that has increased um, dramatically uh, since the, the 1990s, basically. Um, and, and one way they do that is by natural language processing. So they try and look at speeches, and then what they, you do is listen to a little bit of a politician's speech, and then try and see, just based on the words in that speech, could you guess what their political party was? And uh, bef before 1990, out of a f it, it, after you'd listened to four minutes, you had about a 65% chance of predicting the person's party correctly. Now you have about a 95% chance of, of predicting their, their party correctly. So the, you know, the speech is becoming more polarized. There's evidence that this is increasing uh, on, on a variety of dimensions. Um, one difficulty with that is that humans tend to be pretty poor at tracing information. And so, for instance, if I hear information from, say, four different colleagues, it could be that they all heard it from the same source. And I count that as four independent pieces of information, even though it's actually traced back to one piece of information. 
This kind of double counting is something that shows up experimentally, and when we look at what this does to social learning, it means that we reinforce our views, and when we put that together with this sort of homophily, these segregation structures and networks, that ends up uh, producing polarized views, and, and so I think that that's one danger that's going on. Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention was sort of how the internet is changing news production. And as I mentioned, the, you know, the sort of good news about this is it gives everybody in the world a microphone. Anybody can post a video on YouTube, anybody can post whatever they want on the internet and make it widely available. So there's, at some level, it's very liberating and very equalizing. But at the same time, the fact that uh, a news story which is broken by a major uh, news service which spent years investigating something can then be reposted by somebody else or repackaged in a way that says, as reported by the New York Times or as reported by Vanguardia. So, so instead of the, the original story, it's just quoted and, and repackaged. And that is, is changing the incentives for people to invest in, in investigative reporting. Um, estimates, for instance, if you look at US news, newspapers, television, magazines, and other things, the number of people employed in news uh, services actually doing investigative reporting has dropped by more or less a factor of, of a half. So in the US, in 2000, there were roughly 57,000 people employed in this, and now there's less than uh, 30,000 um, television networks. It's, it's, so part of this is there's a, a changing news landscape, and the good news is that there's a lot more information out there the, the, the bad news is that it's not necessarily as careful and deep as it used to be. And I think we need to, to be thinking carefully about what the incentives in a new world are to be producing news and, and who's going to be doing that producing. And then also, uh, ultimately, how it's, it's consumed. There's actually a, a, a wonderful quote by um, David Simon, who was the creator of The Wire. He, he was actually a, a Baltimore Sun reporter for years. And in a Senate hearing, he said, it's going to be one of the great times to be a corrupt politician. Um, so I think, you know, this is the, the news production is, is sort of a cornerstone for democracy. And, and that's something that we need to worry about in terms of the new age of, of the Internet.